Oh, um, there was a time in which, years and years ago, in which conferences were held in beautiful places like uh, Las Vegas or perhaps Amsterdam. And it was hard for me to explain to my wife I was really going to Amsterdam or Las Vegas just for work. So I used to take a picture of the audience to just uh, bring back an evidence that was there apparently for work. But now, the, thanks to the technology, I can take a selfie <laughs> and with you. No, okay, I have, let me just a uh, second. Selfie mode, that's perfect. Woo! This is me. Say hi. No, 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 no. no. Move, do some movement. Yeah, make a wave or something. Action, action. One, two, three, go. Woo! Perfect. Okay, uh, be serious now. We are here to uh, apparently talk about uh, more interesting ways of. Uh, writing software. And uh, I had no idea of how to start this presentation. Uh, I had a, the technical content, but I was looking for a, a funny way to, uh, to get it started. And uh, this morning in, uh, in the Facebook stream, I found this picture from, posted from a friend of mine. Uh, it's a picture, uh, he's teaching a class to mostly young kids. And uh, the command was, uh, this is my iOS class, uh, hard at work on their final projects due Tuesday. And uh, I'm so tempted to add a requirement uh, to, before they finish, when they are close to finish the project, just to give them the sense of real life. And uh, commands were uh, like, do it, prepare them for real life, or perhaps make them suffer and even fire them all and move jobs to China. Uh, this uh, reminded me the cart horse, Boxer, the popular character of the Orwell's Animal Farm book. The Boxer horse uh, is an incredibly strong, dedicated, loyal to the cause horse, uh, and he works, sounds familiar, harder and harder has things go worse and worse with a farm. Uh, the end of the story is pretty sad. He dies of it and it is dismissed to a butcher. Again, sounds familiar? We developers do the same. Let's face it. We are cart horses. We work hard and hard as things go worse and worse with a project and we just wait for the butcher to come. <laughs> and uh, cut the deadlines and budgets shorter and shorter. And then our jobs are moved to China. Now, what we can do in uh, there to improve, mitigate things, the point is that it's not much that things go the bad way and deadlines are cut off, and new requirements are added at any time, at the last minute. It, it does happen, but uh, my opinion is that we, all developers in the world, we never did anything serious to try to address these issues. We just make jokes. Oh, the customer never likes what we do. There should be a reason. Okay, customers are customers, but also architects, also developers, also team managers are what they are. So it's not that customers rule. Customers pay, should pay. <laughs> but there is, there is a, quite a few things we can do in order to make the interaction with customers work uh, in a nicer way. There's no silver bullet here. My friend Hadi will explain that in the closing session. It's domain-driven design, which is the core topic of this keynote, uh, is not a silver bullet either, but is a bullet. 
but the part that makes domain-driven design uh, effective is probably not the part that we most know or are most told about when we hear from gurus like me, domain-driven design. So in history, it all started with this blue book from Eric Evans, which was written, and that's not a secondary point, over a decade ago. Now, in software, 10 years is uh, probably the same as the dinosaur age. Would you, I mean, it's, this is sort of Jurassic book. Doma the vision of domain-driven design we mostly receive from gurus is uh, a Jurassic vision of it. But still, in the folds of domain-driven design, there are quite a few very, very interesting and powerful things. So let's start from the primary intent of domain-driven design. As the book says, tackling complexity in the heart of software. And it contains quite a few innovative guidelines and uh, a relatively revolutionary approach to software design. Okay. This is a much better, no, it's my book. It's not the dinosaur age book, it's the modern, it's the human book. But uh, if you read through the comments uh, on uh, Amazon for, uh, for this book, you see, oh, one is very, very you know, expressive and says, uh, now I've finally made sense of domain-driven design. And this is precisely the point I want to address now. So where does the complexity that domain-driven design tries to tackle, where does it come from? The procedure we typically follow is, in a way, we try to make sense of requirements. So we then typically build a, a model, what we call a data model, and for the most part, it is uh, inspired, at the very minimum, by the relational ideas we grew up with. Uh, and then we, on top of the data model that we feel is ideal to persist the data we work with, uh, we identify relevant tasks and we try to map those relevant business tasks to the physical tables we identified as part of the data model in step two. And then step four, when everything is done, we just try to, well, make it work with users, with humans. We try to put on, to patch on top of that, some user interface. And then we go to the customer. Happy. We're done. And we are on schedule, on time, on everything, just to find out that it is only, well, barely close to what users wanted. It's close, but it's not that. And then we try again, over and over and over again until we consume entirely the budget. Where does complexity come from? Okay, let's start that we proceed bottom up as we always did for years. Uh, we start from uh, what we consider relevant data tables. We have, uh, we see relevant business tasks and we try to make some uh, connection between the two entities, the two layers. In the beginning, it, it appears to be doable. We have a, a lot of arrows there, but it's not that much. It's a level of complexity that we feel reasonably we can manage. The question is, the point is that at some moment in time, uh, the complexity starts growing because we have a, and we see more and more relevant tasks and more and more arrows and more and more paths to interconnect business tasks and persistence needs. And this is where complexity originates to the point that it is really hard and tough to manage. So domain-driven design in the dinosaur age, 10 years ago in software, came up as uh, the wonderful thing to help and save the world. But why domain-driven design, DDD, is so intriguing to developers? Okay, it sounds good, DDD. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good sound, D. 
dee dee dee. Woo. In first place, domain driven design is made of known elements of the design process. So it seems that it systematizes things we would like to be able to do, things we perceive physically perceive as oh that would be the right way to proceed so it's it, it's familiar in a way it organizes how are the ideas we have floating in our minds in a a system in a a systematic set of principles and makes domain modeling domain modeling the core of everything. The focus is on domain modeling, and we love the word the modeling, the action of modeling, because modeling makes us feel, feel like God. We are shaping up the world. Give us the power to model, and, we, and you, may, you, you have a happy developer. You can model. Wow, I'm, a, I'm God. I'm, yeah, I mean, developers, when they are free to model things, they are the closest we have on this planet, on this, on planet heart to God. We, we shape up the world and we love it. At the same time, DDD is about uh, doing things in a different way. So you see the power it has on developers? Be God. Be a unique, original God. That's the perfect scenario for uh, falling in love with this new methodology. But the question is now, does domain-driven design really work? It's been around for over a decade now. The book was written and published in 2003. So it's over 10 years. So it's beyond the dinosaur age. So, I mean, if there, if there were really something powerful in domain-driven design, it should have be visible, it should be visible now, after 10 years. Okay, I mean, even Microsoft, when they start on a new technology, it takes typically three, four years to have something concretely usable. It takes three years to get version three of any product, and version three of products typically work. At, yeah, it takes a few years, not 10 years. Even Microsoft can do wonderful things in 10 years. So domain-driven design in 10 years uh, didn't really work the way it should and the way it could. And there should be a reason for this too. Let's uh, have a look at these uh, two diagrams. On the left here you see the traditional way, the non-DDD way of architecting a system. So you have a databases, you have a... Okay, uh, Table modules, so modules of code that have uh, an organization of functionalities by table. So the grouping of logic, the split of logic takes place based on physical tables. And then there is a way to, the gear, there is a way to connect those actions to UI. On the other side of the screen, you see the same diagram, I mean, an analogous diagram describing the same architecture. And we see, okay, the database, and then something in the back called ORRM. It could be an hibernate, it could be entity framework, and that's it. An ORRM is wonderful because uh, it says, oh, okay, uh, you want to persist your data relationally, that's fine. That's the most effective way it's being used for for ages now. It's fantastic. It works. It makes you confident. You, 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 you have plenty of DBAs all over the world. It's fine. But uh, you are a developer. You don't want to be mistaken for a DBA, for an admin people, IT people, DevOps people. No, no, you are a developer, right? So if you are a developer, you have to be used to work with objects. And unfortunately, objects uh, I mean, can hardly be streamlined to a relational table. So let's uh, put something in the middle, another piece of code that just, uh, you know, does what you should be doing yourself. It takes an object and saves a record. It gets a record and gives you back an object. Instead of having a, a record set, a result set, 
uh, a cursor, you just have an object with the same properties. That's it. It's a tool. But anyway, Aura RAMs are an extra layer we need, the, we, need, we, we, we need to have here if we want to then move objects from the physical level of storage up towards the heights of the application. So the ORM returns objects and passes objects up to what is the intermediate middle tier that at that point is no longer made of table-oriented modules, but it's something called the generically a domain model. Wow, I, again, model and again domain. Two words, two keywords, two, two buzzwords that keep developers so happy. But now, can you honestly say that the model on the right is uh, objectively better than the model on the left? There's no difference, honestly. Be there is no difference at all. I mean, I'm not saying that anything is wrong, but you can even avoid, you, you, you cannot say also that anything is better. They are just two ways of doing things. So if the point is you should do DDD because uh, it's better, you should quantify what better means. Better what? And when it comes to this, better simply means it's cleaner. It's more elegant. But we are not a fashion industry. So, and not, not even we work in, uh, in scenarios where cleaning is part of the business. We just work and get paid, hopefully, by building things that work. So, why should I spend days around uh, the ideal design of a class and then uh, spend hours uh, wondering, okay, and now where can I load data into these classes? Where should I put my load from database, load by ID method? Because domain-driven design says you never ever will have any method in your domain model that deals with the database. That's the aura RAM to deal with connection strings. You are the super developer. You are expected to think, to fly high, to think big and just focus on the dynamics of objects. No need to dirty your hands with databases, but still you need to load data into your objects. And again, why should I spend days around the the design of a class where I can find a non-classy that was a an attempt to make a joke, non-classy no classes and no elegance non-classy way that helps me to do things, the things that I should do quickly, more quickly I mean if I know a way to achieve things I have no need honestly to make my code cleaner and more elegant. Well, I can even do that, but there's, there is no business point. I cannot go to a customer and say, hey, you pay me more because my code is elegant. If you, get, if you can get paid for delivering elegance in your code, okay, tell me and show me how you do that because I'm not able. So we're back now to design. Okay, DDD is Domain Driven Design. Let's rephrase. Domain-driven design is, just swapping words around, is design driven by the domain. This makes a, a whole world of a difference. Design driven by the domain. It's not about building a domain model, an object model with, uh, uh, in which classes uh, more or less map to have the same names as entities. So it's not about you know, having customers and invoices and the customer has an object with the same properties as the corresponding table in the database. Design driven by the domain is about understanding. It's about the perception, the learning. The, the, it's, it's about getting familiar as much as possible with the dynamics of the business domain. 
it's about understanding much more than it is about physically writing, implementing code. And now, let's try to, to see in which way the foundation of DDD as a methodology maps to the idea of a design driven by the aspects and the characteristics of the domain. In a DDD, there are two distinct parts. And uh, in summary, you always need one of the two. And the other can be happily dismissed and even ignored. And the part you can happily ignore is what in most people believe is all about DDD. So the real segment of DDD that matters and works in the real world is the part that nobody talks about. This part is uh, called, okay, it's an analytical part, and uh, in a DDD terminology is called strategic design. Okay, so there is a, uh, there's a bit of confusion in the deliberate confusion in this slide. So there is an analytical part in DDD that really matters that in terms of DDD terms is strategic design. So the strategic design is about analysis. Everything else is implementation. And implementation is always a detail. If you use the tools in domain-driven design to understand, to support the analysis of the requirements and the understanding of the domain, that works. And that is an aspect of DDD that is valuable to just every project. Everything else, so the physical implementation, is a detail. You can use the classic domain model according to the known rules of not having primitives, uh, not having constructors, uh, using value objects, aggregates, you know, the, the, the set of rules you typically associate with uh, DDD. That, that's implementation detail. The real juice is in the analysis, what is called strategic design in real uh, DDD terms. So, conducting and domain analysis using domain-driven design, it's all about a couple of tools or patterns. One is called the ubiquitous language, and it is all about uh, arranging as a first thing and most important thing, a vocabulary of terms, a glossary. So if you don't understand the business terms, and if you don't track them down in a whatever is persistent, so it could be an Excel file, a wiki, typically a wiki, or a, yeah, a Word or Excel file, maybe a shared uh, office document. But it, it's important that you have a, a digital version of a glossary in which all relevant business terms are described, are listed with their meaning and their interconnections to other words. Uh, it's about creating a grammar. So when you started the basics of programming languages, at some point in your life and in your career, uh, you learned that any programming language is made of keywords, and uh, keywords expect to be related to other keywords and other elements that can be a variable, typically a variable, or local or global variable, maybe an object. So you know that there are rules that tie together words. So trying to generalize, the point of ubiquitous language is creating a glossary, a plain uh, dictionary where you have the list of nouns of words that make sense in the business, and for each of those, the list of actions that are legally performed in the business context on those names. 
if you have a customer, which are the actions in the business domain you perform on a customer. And each action you can perform brings its own rules, so its own conditions. So the, the fundamental idea is turning the elements of the domain we observe, we see in front of us, into something close to a grammar. Not because having a grammar per se is uh, fundamental and brings concrete benefits, but because it helps immensely to learn about the dynamics of the system. And if we don't know how things go, we are not in condition of discussing, arguing, even argumenting requirements we receive. So the, one of the points of software development that makes it so e expensive and ineffective is that we passively receive requirements from users. Users said A, fine. Users say B, which is the opposite of A, is fine. We never or hardly go back to the customer and say, look, do you want A or do you want B? My understanding of your domain suggests that you need instead C. So I'm going to build C. Why? I want A. No, I, I'm going to give you C because C covers this, 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 this. So we, we must be able to gain enough knowledge of the domain in order to make sense of requirements. And this means those that don't really belong, those that are ambiguous, unclear, contradictory, if we don't understand what we are building, there is no chance we can build software effectively. And what we do today is we passively receive and take as the law whatever is a requirement that the customer brings. And customers can bring requirements at any time, and customers typically bring requirements that deny other requirements. Because we, we never talk to just one customer. We talk to several stakeholders. And every stakeholder in a project typically brings his own vision of the business and delivers you the, in the best way it can what it believes it needs. But you are building instead a software for the entire company so that includes the strict needs of that particular stakeholder but also of everything, everybody else. So, we must manage to understand which are the relevant elements in the domain and how they interact to each other. This is the primary purpose of the ubiquitous language. So a vocabulary shared by all involved parties and used in all forms of spoken and written communication. Let me give you a concrete example of troubles you may face if you fail on this point. Uh, one of my best customers um, works uh, in uh, professional sports. Uh, a couple of years ago they hired a top quality architect, MVP, not me. Uh, and uh, the company commissioned uh, the building of a back office infrastructure, uh, essentially a tool, an in, a set of internal tool, web-based tools to collect information about the tennis tournaments. So the system had to receive uh, on a weekly basis uh, information about uh, you know, uh, uh, technical tournaments and players in the tournament and then the the schedule of play, and then results, and then scores, and then statistics, and TV graphics, overlays, and so forth. Fine. Now, in tennis, the domain, so the business domain says that there is a tournament. Within the context of a tournament, uh, there are several draws. So the men's singles, the women's singles, the doubles, and so forth. Typically, there are five or six different draws in the context of a tournament. Each draw is a collection of draw items, where a draw item is, a simple, is simply a match. Okay. 
fine. Sounds like an easy way of organizing things. Except that the architect, he, because he wanted, he, he felt like God, he wanted to shape up the business, came up with calling the tournament what is in reality a draw. And when he found out, oh, but you give me this requirement later, when he found out that actually uh, there is a, an entity that collects together multiple uh, draws, he called tournament group. So instead of having tournament to draw and draw items, we had a tournament group, tournament, draw items. The system works. Fine. But in the company, it's two years now that when we e exchange emails and we say tournament ID, nobody knows what's really meant. <laughs> if it's the, the draw ID, <laughs> so indicates the ID that indicates the men's singles, a bunch of matches, or a bunch of draws. In the real business, a tournament ID indicates the whole thing, the collection of draws. But in the system, tournament ID indicates a single draw. It's a mismatch. It's a fantastic mismatch. And every time there is a new feature to build, and last time was last week, I got an email. Dino, we need a new. Uh, now I'm, I, I took over him, and I'm managing the system. So it's me now, the guy who receives new requests. And the last one I got last week was uh, we need to have a service that exposes stats, blah, 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 blah. And now we pass you the tournament ID. Excuse me, what are you really passing me? <laughs> what do you mean by tournament ID? That's constant now. And every time this term comes up, we fuck the architect. <laughs> we, we put curse on him because he, he made this fantastic mess. So ubiquitous language, understanding the ubiquitous language is key. Because the, the guy there, as an architect, I mean, as, as a developer, he did a good job because the system works. As an architect, he totally failed because he completely missed the ubiquitous language point. He tried to recreate, like God, a new environment instead of simply mirroring what was in front of him, which was the real business. Now, second pattern is bounded context. Another common mistake that we developers or architects or designers do is we, again, because we, we love to feel like God, we want to recreate the entire world. So when we approach modeling a new domain, we do that with the best intentions, and we, at some point, uh, find out that if the world will be perfect if we create a galaxy base root class to model everything from the sun down. Now, having a single model is hardly helpful because the real world, the real business domains are fairly complicated. And they result from the interaction of multiple smaller contexts. And in each context, it could be that the same entity has slightly different characteristics. The entity account might mean something to human resources and something different to people working in the billing department. It's more or less the same kind of thing. But it could be, and often it is the case, that there are slightly different set of properties, slightly different expected behavior. So what we do is, uh, it's account there, account here. Because I'm a super architect, I, I'm, I want to create a base class that groups the two distinct set of functionalities together. And when, the moment in which we do this, we also call ourselves, oh, well, I'm a lover of object-oriented principles. We pronounce words like solid, single responsibility principle, open-close principle, dependency injection. 
And then we try to put together under the single container of a class distinct responsibilities. Domain-driven design, and in particular the bounded context tool or, or, or pattern, says, look, be ready, be constantly ready to identify boundaries that indicate the contours of different business domains. And when you identify uh, that to different people the same word means something different, put there, split there the model into smaller, into different pieces, and create multiple models, and call each model a bounded context. So if you have a, a unique domain in the problem space, a bounded context is a subdomain. Don't be afraid of splitting things. It doesn't mean you are a bad architect because you cannot find a common base class. You are really simplifying things and you are really rendering things the way they are really shaped up in the real world. So a bounded context, the definition could be an area of the business domain that is better treated independently. And better means it makes it easier for you to deal with that. Does it mean it may introduce some duplication redundancy? And what's the point of that? Yes, probably. And so what? <laughs> it's not really bad to have a, a bit of redundancy. Business intelligence is all about redundancy. It's all about having the same information exposed in different angles. It's not a big deal. Okay. Uh, principles, software principles like dry, don't repeat yourself, is a different thing. It says if, don't write twice the same code. But we, ha we have class libraries in all languages. We, we are still good developers. So dry applies to when you, write, you, when you physically write the code, try not to write the same code twice. And that's a, an implementation detail. But architecturally speaking, redundancy is not bad per se. So splitting a domain in multiple contexts may introduce possibly the need of, you know, using the same code in different blocks of the system. Fine. If it's exactly the same code, no problem. Create a common DLL. Fine. Otherwise, if it's only it's a similarity, something that looks like the same, well, having distinct blocks of code means that you can handle them independently with no risk of regression and no risk of breaking things, fixing things here and breaking things there. Shaping the bounded context, the area of a bounded context is anyway challenging because it has to do with how you as an architect see the model and the world in front of you. People use different languages. Developers and domain experts use different languages. But even business people from different departments, they use the different languages. So the real benefit of domain-driven design is have making sense of user requirements so that we mitigate the risks of misunderstandings at any time, avoid translations between different jargons, have a common terminology, and more importantly, we reduce the need of assumptions. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why software is expensive is that too often we leave developers alone. Okay, you, you build this, and that this is hardly detailed, so that at some point the developer needs to make enough you know, assumptions on what is this. And when you make assumption, it's a guess. <laughs> assumption is a better word, but it's a guess. It's 50-50. It could be wrong, it could be right. If it's right, thanks God. Otherwise, it's wrong. And if it's wrong, you have to throw it away <laughs> at some point. Uh, agile. <laughs> agile. I mean, agile is great in theory, but agile contains an aspect that never happened in over 10 years, the 
collaboration of customers. So Agile works beautifully if you can really go back to the customer after the sprint is done, get precise and specific feedback and fix things immediately if they are wrong. So if you make a guess and the guess is wrong, you find out at the end of the sprint when you go back to the customer and assuming that the customer gives you appropriate feedback. What happens in reality is instead that you end the sprint, if you go to the customer, the customer says, okay, it's fine, don't even look at what you've done until the entire product is delivered and then, oh, but it's not, this is wrong. So you don't fix the single individual assumption that was wrong, but you have to fix the Cartesian product of all wrong guesses. So the function that describes how things could go wrong is an exponential <laughs> instead of linear function. Now, we cannot change the agile thing. We cannot change the customer mindset. What we can do instead is uh, changing the way in which we work. So if we can, redu if we, if we can use uh, techniques to reduce the risk of making wrong assumptions, that would probably increase significantly the chances we deliver just what customers want. And in addition to this, if we use uh, uh, something called the UX-driven design, which is essentially use a lot more of wireframes to, make, to, to discuss to customers before we start writing code, so to create a sort of quick prototypes before we start writing code to give users the concrete experience of what they're going to get. If the workflow, if the, uh, the, the storyboard for each and every feature is exactly what they were expecting. Uh, if we are agile at the wireframe level before we start coding, we collect a lot more information about what is the real thing that users want, and we do that before we start writing code. When we start writing code, we know a lot more about the final destination. Today, when we write software, it's just like, you know, we, we jump on a plane, and we don't know where the plane is going, so we'll find out along, oh, along the way. Oh, we're going to Europe, we're going to Asia, we're going to South America, that's it. No, uh, Understanding is key. So the ubiquitous language is, uh, can be seen as a sphere. The gray sphere here representing the business domain. There you have words and terms identifying, referring to key business concepts. And uh, also words and concepts referring to key technical actions because we are still writing software. So concepts, cross-cutting concerns are still part of the software we write. So we must focus on uh, terminology uh, related to the business, but also be aware that there are technical actions. So delete, calling you know, an action delete an order makes no sense, because in the business you don't delete an order, you cancel an order. So even the, 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 the choice of words to express an action should be focused on the business instead of the technical details of the implementation. In an online store environment, it's common to have uh, the concept of canceling an order that has been placed at some point. In reality, that is, for the most part, consisting in the implementation of deleting a record from some database. But if we want to make sure that we are close to the business, we should teach ourselves to ignore and forget about the technical details of the implementation and focus on the fact that we have to implement a feature that can cancel an order. And cancel the order should be part of the common vocabulary. Everybody should be saying, cancel the order and never delete the record. Sounds like a 
just a terminology? That was exactly what my fellow architect told when we built the tennis system. What's the difference? It's an ID. You can call it tournament group or tournament ID. What's the point? Except that it, in two years later, it's still an issue for the company. And there is no, because either we rewrite completely the system, but even if we, we completely rewrite the system, because real users can be sometimes dummy people, so because they grew up with the concept that there's a tournament ID and tournament group ID, even if we, if we, even if we rewrite completely the system, we still have people around the company mixing up together tournament group and tournament IDs. That's an issue for the company. An issue that was artificially created by a not so smart software architect who totally missed the point of domain driven design. So, in summary, natural uh, language at the foundation of software. This uh, natural language uh, is not created in a lab. So it's not that a team of smart software architects sit down and create artificially this language. That ubiquitous language emerges out of interviews, the classic interviews you run with customers, the classic brainstorming sessions in which you try to understand. So it's just a way for you to uh, write down requirements using a, an intermediate kind of language. And more importantly, this ubiquitous language uh, is not a language that is written in a day or two. It changes over time as you learn more and more insights about the domain you are trying to express in software and modeling. So the language is iteratively composed and refined along the way. It continuously changes, even though it doesn't change indefinitely. So at some point, it, it stabilizes. But it's not a matter of a session. So you cannot go to a meeting and come out of the meeting with the language fully defined and, and, and written in stone. It takes iterations, but the iterations stop naturally at some point when everything is probably known. And uh, more, the language must be unambiguous and fluent. Unambiguous means uh, no doubts about what each word and each action means. No doubt. Everything has to be absolutely clear and fluent because you must be able to express actions just concatenating words. I will have another session later today in which I give you a concrete demonstration with Visual Studio, with just coding, C-sharp code, how, what it means, or what I mean by creating a ubiquitous language for a sport-related scenario. And you will see that I will, at the end of the, of the demo, I can write unit tests that are you know, like a plain text, yet they are methods on classes with business logic and uh, you know, expressing the action, the business tasks, has a fluent language, like clo really close to the natural language. The language, the ubiquitous language, has to meet the expectations of domain experts. So when the domain experts read your unit tests, they should be able to understand what you're doing. And they should be able to tell you, oh, this is right, this is wrong. But not because they are software experts. Because they read names, verbs, and nouns, and they understand what the software is doing. Expressivity. And they can tell you, oh, this is right, this is wrong. And fixing algorithms becomes easy, trivially easy, if you have a ubiquitous language and if the language meets the expectations of the main experts and expectations of technical people as well. So, keeping in sync ubiquitous language and uh, the real classes you have in code is key. And it means that if you at some point realize that there is a better way for uh, people 
to call certain things. So the name you've chosen for your classes is not completely right. You rename. What? Renaming? Renaming means changing classes or property names throughout the entire code base. Yeah. Get a resharper license and you're done. <laughs> or get a, you know, a, 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 a Dev Express code rush Re license and you're done. This is where tools, code, coding assistant tools help. And they are fantastic in domain driven design. This kind of tools are great, are fantastic. Because in a couple of clicks, you fix everything. So there are no excuses. If you use tools, you can really keep in sync the ubiquitous language, which is a part of the analysis, with the real code. And if you fail keeping those things in sync, you are likely to create a bug. So missing a rename can really mean creating a bug somewhere in the code. Business domain, split in bounded context, identify interrelations, and from the problem space you have a domain, domain model in the solution space, Subdomains identified logically, bounded context in the solution space. This is the graphics of domain-driven design. Each bounded context, so each segment of the original domain you identified, has its own specific language, its own independent implementation, with interfaces to talk to other elements, other context. The problem of domain-driven design with language and the bounded context attempts to solve is like this. You start modeling and you see a few elements. You learn more, you add more elements. You allocate some of the features to a team and some of the other features to another team with overlapping at some point. How would you handle that? What to do at this point? Would you extract the common part and assign that to a third team? Would you have each of the two teams create copies of the same code, independently maintained? Are all options. You decide what is better. And there is no obvious answer. But resulting from, from this analysis, you create a system that, as an example, can be exemplified like this. This is the essentially the, the uh, 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 the DDD representation, the context map of an online store. There is a front-end website and a back-office website. A shopping cart block logic and the block with implementation of business rules. Accounting, shipping and payment, and shipping and payment that probably point to external systems. And then there is also persistence at some point. This is what you need to do. This is what results from your, this is your top level architecture. And now you must be able as an architect to see this and plan implementation. So for example, blue blocks, front end and shopping cart can be the same website. Back office can be another independent website. Business rules and maybe payment logic are a class library. Accounting and shipping are another class library. Persistence is another class library. What about the relationships between uh, the themes behind those features? In domain driven design, you have uh, things called relationships. The arrows with U and D. U is, is upstream, D is downstream. Upstream is the master the supplier. D is the slave or the customer. So U and D define a master-slave type of relationship. So, for example, the U block with accounting, biz rules, payment and shipping, so the team in charge of, those, of that part of the system is the upstream compared to the websites. 
So if uh, the biz logic changes for whatever reason, the dependent systems has to update themselves. They depend on. So it's the lead architect that sets what is upstream and what is downstream. And this graphic here is called context map. And each of the blue blocks is a bounded context. And the relationships indicate the way in which you, the lead architect, imagine this system has to be built in terms of allocation to work on teams and priority between contexts. This is the output of domain-driven design, with the strategic analysis of domain-driven design you run through ubiquitous language and bounded context. So you use ubiquitous language and bounded context patterns to create a context map. The context map is about the top-level architecture. And then each of the blue blocks is a bounded context with its own language, business language, its own implementation, regardless of technologies. So if you code, say, the shipping gateway there using web forms and playing a two-tier logic, UI database directly with no intermediation, which is apparently couldn't be farther from the idea of DDD, you are still doing DDD if that results from a context map. So the real value and the modern view of DDD is essentially creating the top level, understanding the system to create the top level architecture. Everything else is an implementation detail. Thank you very much.